Um, I'm, I'm rather addicted to uh, titles which have several meanings, and uh, they're always difficult, impossible really, to translate. Uh, but a man of parts in English uh, is a slightly archaic phrase, meaning a man of many talents. It's also, it could be seen as um, parts is also used in the plural to mean private parts, genitals, which were very important to wealth, okay, so he was a man of parts in that sense. Uh, he, was, he also himself had a, a theory that uh, the idea that we are a unified, individual, unique self is actually an illusion. Um, we're made up of different parts and we kind of tell a, a, a story about ourselves to make it seem as if we're totally integrated. And he actually wrote a thesis very late in life, uh, which he got a PhD from London University for, uh, b b developing this idea, which is in some ways, again, ahead of its time. I mean, it's very much the post-structuralist or deconstructionist idea of the decentered self, you know. Uh, so there's that. And also the novel itself is divided into parts. I mean, part one, part two, part three. So there yeah, are all those meanings, which I'm afraid are all completely lost in the French title, <laughs> which is always, always a problem. I, I can't say this was a, a conscious uh, strategy, but I think that I tried to recreate the past, which after all, I didn't observe. I wasn't there. I wasn't born. Um, I drew on my uh, reading of the fiction of the time to uh, recreate Wells's life in an appropriate style. Uh, and as you say, I mean, uh, it seemed to me as you read about Moore that um, there was a, uh, Gorky's lover probably, uh, there was a connection with Russian fiction and it seemed natural to allude to that, you know. Um, I, you know, in, in creating character of Elizabeth von Armin, I um, got hints from reading her fiction. So I created her in, in her own style, if you like. So it is inevitably a, um, a tissue of, uh, of, of, of styles derived from literary texts. And, uh, you know, in dealing with Henry James, I mean, his, his uh, elaborate syntax enters into everything he says and does. Uh, so I like, um, I like fiction to have uh, a novel to have um, a variety of tone and register, and that's one of the ways it, it enters into this book, yes. As a scholar and critic, I was, um, in my Originally, I was a, a formalist critic, uh, and I was always interested in technique and uh, how words were manipulated, and then how narrative was manipulated. Um, and I, uh, I still believe in that kind of criticism, but I think that um, uh, it was taken too far in, in the post-structuralist era of criticism. Uh, rather crudely designated as the idea of the death of the author, you know, because as an author I know how much um, I'm trying to express of what I've intuited from you know, my observation of the world and life and so on. And the idea that my books are just created in the mind of the reader, out of my control, seems to me basically false. Uh, so that's one reason. I think I've, I've, I've heard many people say that as they get older, they prefer reading bi biographies to reading novels, or they prefer factual books to fictional books. That may be something to do with aging, actually. Um, and you, you, uh, the sheer effort of recreating a fictional universe inside your head every time you open a novel uh, becomes more and more onerous, I think, as you get older, become more and more impatient with it. And somehow the, uh, the real, the, the detail of real lives seems somehow more authentic and, and interesting. Um, and so uh, I, I certainly have um, become more interested in, in, uh, in, in biography. But I don't see that as, um, as, as, as in any way um, contradictory to formal analysis of the work to show how it 
affects you and why it affects you in a certain way. But I still enjoy doing that kind of criticism. But um, to suggest that the book doesn't belong in any way to the writer's own human nature and experience seems to me to go against common sense, really. So if I told the, the, the story through the consciousness of Wells alone, there's inevitably, that has the effect of um, uh, having a, an uncritical um, presentation of a character, unless he is deep, fundamentally unreliable, and Wells wasn't. Uh, so I felt the need of another perspective, and uh, I thought of this device, and this is, this is not factual, uh, that... Um, in his old age, as he was getting ill and, and approaching death, he, he was in the habit of talking to himself. And so he was, uh, as it were, rehearsing uh, the kind of criticisms of his behaviour that he was aware people made and that he thought they would make after his death. And I think uh, some you know, writers in Wells's position think about how posterity is going to think about them. So uh, I develop this second voice which is <clears throat> a mixture of things it's it, as you say partly uh, questions I would have liked to ask it's questions and, or challenges that um, act biographers and other writers have made about Wells and it, it it has the advantage that I acknowledge the criticisms that can be made of Wells's behavior at the same time I give him a chance to defend them defend himself against them and I found that that um, really released the book, as far as I was concerned. I knew I could always drop back into that mode if I felt, well, we need, it. We need a little bit of uh, <coughs> cold analysis of that episode in his life. Uh, how could he defend it? How does, what does he think of it in his old age? And um, <coughs> some people don't like it because it's a kind of breaking frame device. It's a, a non-realistic device, uh, but I think what you gain from it should um, outweigh any kind of reservations. It, it breaks the illusion of reality temporarily, uh, but um, I like a novel to have more than one sort of register, more than one style throughout. Uh, and uh, the frame story also allowed me to use various points of view so that you get Rebecca's critical views, Anthony West's view and so on, and, and that was very useful too. But I knew that the main story had to be mainly as subjectively experienced by Wells, but with these little interludes in which uh, more sceptical questioning uh, statements and questions are raised. The pattern in, in my work I mainly see is not really visible in this book, I don't think. Uh, I um, perceive in my work a tendency to a binary structure, I mean, to bringing two different uh, people, two different um, cultures, two different professions, two different uh, worlds. It may be America and England, it may be industry and academia or whatever. Um, and to set them into um, conflict or contact, see what happens, um, see if they change their views. That is a pattern which recurs in a lot of my work, but um, and it does in author author in that you've got Henry James and, and George du Maurier, for instance. In this novel, it is only uh, sort of weakly visible in a weak sense in uh, the opposition between um, Wells and James. But um, what I was more, I think, the the, the structural pattern of um, this novel is not uh, contrast, but uh, serial repetition. So you've got two wives, both of whom he loves, but they don't, neither of them satisfy him sexually. You've got two young women who uh, pursue him and he gives them children. One asks him to, the other by accident. Um, you've got um, two young women, Rosamond and... Um, Amber, who have young men who are courting them and who Wells regards as rivals. And curiously, they both get married in, at the same time virtually to them. Uh, so that 
there's that element of, of repetition in his life, which I think gives a sort of symmetry or formal balance to the to the book, it's so that it doesn't seem just one damn thing after another. Uh, and that was I, I found it a much more difficult book to write in that sense than author 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 the the story just fell into my hands. This wonderful friendship which becomes a kind of rivalry, and and and. Uh, uh, De Maurier's star rises just as James's collapses. It was, all, you know, fell into my hands. With Wells, I had to struggle to find um, a shape, and that was the shape I decided. I decided on following the sequence of the major women in his life and how that affected his professional life, uh, how it impacted on it, uh, and how it showed the um, the tensions and contradictions in his own character. Well, that's, that's what struck me. I was astonished, when I, particularly that he used the, the word the world brain, you know, for, for the book in which he outlined this idea, because that is what the internet is, actually. Um, and the only thing it needed, uh, I mean, his idea was an encyclopedia. In one description of it, in one of his utopian books, he, he imagines it's an enormous institution, which he based in Barcelona for some reason. Uh, with with million, literally millions of people uh, running it, and they would be sifting through all uh, you know scientific literature, other literature, and uh, deciding what was real knowledge and putting that on microfilm, which was the most um, convenient way of storing information in Wells's lifetime. And uh, then people would request it, and it would be sent to them by aeroplane. That was his idea. Of course, he didn't envisage uh, who did, you know. The transistor, the the, the uh, uh, micro, uh, what's what trans, what's the word I want? Um, the, 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 basically, he didn't he didn't um, uh, predict the computer, uh, which is revolutionised our world completely. But he was groping towards it. I mean, I think he, if he had lived a bit longer, he would have latched on to. Uh, the computer, which was just being in, sort of invented at the time, and he was dying, actually. Uh, it, but um, yeah, I mean, that was extraordinary to me that he had that he used that metaphor, the world brain. And I smuggled into my book the phrase in English that um, I, he he thinks of it as a worldwide web of knowledge, which of course is is a phrase we know <laughs> he didn't use, as far as I know. So that that's the kind of little uh, liberty that I take with history, that sort of thing. Mediapart. He was very proud of being, um, you know, extremely well endowed in that respect. <laughs> we, we have, the, apparently, the three of his mistresses commented on this. Um, uh, but he is often portrayed as a kind of... Um, heartless, uh, predatory seducer of young women. Um, and I don't think that that is um, a fair portrait of him, because in all the cases that I um, studied and, and uh, the characters that I wrote about, the major women in his life, um, with the exception of the first one, Isabel, um, they all pursued him first. They went after him, and he responded. He said once, you know, the part of Joseph in um, the Bible never appealed to me, you know, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, um, that he, he, he would never resist um, an overture from a woman. Well, you might say he should have exercised restraint sometimes. But I, try, I think I um, showed that, um, for instance, in the case of um, uh, Amber Reeves, she was infatuated with him, attracted to him, and uh, eventually he fell in love with her and couldn't resist. And at that stage, Jane was apparently um, willing to allow this relationship, was very friendly to Amber, actually assisted that uh, relationship. So that's very different from the stereotype of the uh, selfish, predatory, adulterer and seducer of young women. 
Same with Rebecca West, when I sort of retrace the development of that relationship. Rebecca West went after Wells, and he kept her at a distance for some time. Uh, but characteristically, um, when she eventually seemed to get over it and to <coughs> um, stop pestering him, he then began to hanker after her. <laughs> and his existing relationship with a mature woman who was his mistress, Catherine von Armin, uh, was Elizabeth von Armin, uh, was, was uh, collapsing. And um, I had to use a little bit of imagination for the <coughs> crucial meeting when he meets her in Piccadilly, meets Jane, um, sorry, meets Rebecca in Piccadilly, and, and they, that is not factually based. I had to, I knew, in, in his own memoir um, of his sexual life, he says, uh, you know, I came back, I quarreled with Catherine von Armin, I came back to England, Rebecca and I became lovers, that's all he says. So that is precisely where the novel novelist has to step in and imagine, well, how did they become novel, uh, lovers? What happened? So, uh, but again, um, it's, a, it's quite a complicated process. It's not as if uh, Wells said, right, I fancy that young woman, I'm going to get her. You know, it wasn't like that. No. Yeah, but... Uh, I, perhaps I should say that I couldn't have written this novel without the existence of this uh, sort of secret postscript to his autobiography that he wrote, uh, which was the record of his sexual life, his sexual relationships, and was to be published after his death and after the death of all the women. And um, uh, I, because you couldn't, you couldn't invent and imagine all that, it wouldn't be legitimate, in my view, for the kind of novel I would want to write. But I felt it was nothing. I was, no relationship was invented. It's all there. And uh, it, was, it didn't tell me too much, but it told me just enough uh, to do the novel. He had many passing affairs, which he called passard, and uh, some probably they were just off of one night, what we call one night stands in England, probably. Uh, and I, I allude to them, but I don't bother with them very much. Uh, I'm interested in the people he was emotionally involved with, one way, one way or another. Um, and uh, I think he was the... Uh, you know, capable of um, uh, romantic passion. Uh, but he wasn't very good at describing it, actually, as he admitted himself. His love scenes uh, are rather stereotyped, um, and Rebecca West often mocked him about that. Um, it's as if uh, somehow he couldn't, he didn't, couldn't find the language, or maybe he felt that society wouldn't allow him to describe exactly what he felt. Uh, and I, I, I make that point in passing. He, he was not like D.H. Lawrence or James Joyce, you know, um, breaking the boundaries of permitted description of sexuality. He, he was rather conventional in that respect. Mediapart. The word novel implies that it's a work of fiction, uh, completely. But um, if you call it a biographical novel, you're saying, no, this is uh, partly fact and partly fiction. It is a hybrid form. And uh, you, you're saying that the actual actions and events which had consequences are recorded fact. But the minute detail in which they were experienced is imagined. Uh, that, that, it comes down to that. There are many kinds of biographical novel, and some of them don't pretend to have any real historical accuracy at all. Uh, and they can be almost fantasies, uh, imagining some real person in a, a, a context they never actually experienced or meeting somebody they never actually met. But um, my idea of, of, of this kind of novel, the way I do it, is to... Uh, be faithful to the known facts about the person's life and to, to use a novelistic technique to imagine how they experience that life, which is really in your head. Um, and so that um, uh, there, are many, uh, there are many incidents in the book which are actually happened, and I know they're true, and all the important ones which had consequences are recorded facts. But 
but when you're, say, describing a person uh, moving through time and space, they're having thoughts, perceptions, uh, they say things to other people, most of that is never recorded. And that is why we always, I think, have a, a very partial view of a person from uh, evidence-based biography. And so it seems to me that um, by using novelistic methods which are designed to express the person's consciousness and also having dramatic interaction, dialogue with other people, uh, if you if you soaked yourself in this person's life and and you got really you feel you've got some notion of their personality, you can give it the sort of illusion of life that a, a novel has. But it has the extra interest that if the reader trusts you, they know that this is actually the, the, the life itself. Uh, and in the case of Wells, I mean he he um, he lives such a an extraordinary personal life with his uh, two wives and many mistresses and casual sexual encounters that if you if that was in a totally fictional novel I think the readers would be skeptical they would they wouldn't believe it, it, it but uh, since the underlying contract with the reader is that these are the real relationships um, then I think it has a, a special kind of uh, interest yeah so that, that's basically the way I do it. And I have a little prefatory note which explains the limits of, mm. uh, of, the, of the book and the conventions I follow. Yeah. Mediapart. First of all, I enjoyed writing author, author very much. It was a completely new kind of novel for me. Uh, the only novel so far about um, before my lifetime, um, the only novel about a real person that I'd written. Um, I thought it combined what I'd learned from my professional life as a scholar uh, and um, with, with my abilities as a novelist. So I was sort of uh, open to having an idea for another book of that kind. And um, I was... Uh, asked to edit one of Wells's novels or write an introduction to a new edition of Kipps and I researched his life at that time which when he wrote it which was the early years of the 19th century of the 20th century and uh, uh, discovered or rediscovered his involvement with the Fabian Society and his involvement with the family of um, Hubert Bland and Edith Bland and their daughter and I thought this was this is the stuff of fiction you know this is the stuff of a novel and so I began to do more research with a view to writing uh, a, a novel about Wells in which that, 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 that uh, involvement would be quite central but not the only thing because I soon saw that there was a repetition in, in Wells's life. He kept, um, in spite of his belief in sort of purely recreational sex every now and again, he would fall in love with some woman who he thought was his ideal partner and that would get him into all kinds of trouble, which, or jeopardy, as, as writers call it, which is what you need in a, in a story. Wells um, didn't always think of the novel that way. He set out to, to write literary fiction, and uh, that was why he admired James. But he, he gradually became impatient with the art novel, if you like, and thought fiction should engage with society and change people's attitudes and, uh, and, and not... To uh, you know, pursue artistic perfection as, as James did. Later in life he, he admitted that this meant his work would not last, uh, much of it would not last beyond the issues it dealt with. He was accepting of that. Mediapart. I suppose one of the reasons I feel uh, drawn to Wells as a subject is that I have this, I have this in common with him that um, I grew up in a lower middle class social background in South London and I went to London University, my local university. I lived at home and went in and out which is not typical in England um, and uh, Wells likewise he had um, uh, he left school quite but he, he he got himself an education, but uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't the best education available by any means. Uh, and uh, he went to London University, well 
um, what became London University, what became uh, the Imperial College of Science. Uh, and um, I think he always felt that, that um, he was looked down on by the cultural establishment, um, most of whose members had been to public school and to Oxford or Cambridge. And, um, of course, his fame brought him into contact with all those people, and eventually um, they had to admit that he was a, a genius of a kind, that he was a major intellectual force. So all these Oxford and Cambridge educated people were uh, trying to persuade him to join Fabian Society and inviting him to give papers at Oxford and Cambridge. And, uh, this, this, um, I, I tried to to recreate what his feelings were about the ancient universities, and uh, I was drawing a little bit on my own feeling about them, which is in one way they're very attractive. I mean, as environments, when you go to Cambridge, for instance. Uh, it's, it's such a beautiful place. The architecture is lovely. And it seems a, a town totally devoted to knowledge, to the acquisition of knowledge. Of course it isn't, but it, it gives that impression. Um, and, but it's full of strange antique uh, customs and shibboleths and uh, jargon, which is designed to exclude, um, because it's, it's, it's uh, you know, you've got to pronounce a name in this way, not that way. Or the fact that all the colleges none of the colleges has the name on the outside. You're supposed to know which one is which and where it is. And I, I used that to express um, Wells' mixture of attraction and repulsion. Media